Good evening. This is Sleep Chamber, the sleeping podcast. The words you're about to hear are not important. You can listen to them and you can drift away. You can zone out and you can pay attention. You can do what you please with this podcast. The most important thing to keep in mind is the words are not important. I just made them up. The facts are not necessarily true, nor are they necessarily false. This podcast is beyond false and true. It's just words. And the purpose is for you to relax, zone out, maybe giggle a little, and then fall asleep. My name is Henrik. I don't live where you live, probably. You can probably hear that because of my accent. It doesn't matter, though, because this isn't about accents. This is about you. So, with that said, it is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there is nothing you can do. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess who loved to sing and dance. She was kind and gentle, and everyone loved her. One day, a wicked witch cursed her. and she could no longer sing or dance. She was so sad that she locked herself in her room and never came out again. But one day, a handsome prince came to her rescue. He broke the curse and they lived happily ever after. How many stories like this have you heard in your life? The prince saves the princess by killing the dragon and rescuing her from its lair. They fall in love. And they get married. And they have children. And they live happily ever after. But what happens after? This is the story about after, happily ever after. The princess decided to open a bakery after she realized how much she loved baking. She knew that she wanted to share her passion with others, and she thought that a bakery would be the perfect way to do that. She started out by making a few simple recipes, but she quickly began experimenting with different flavors and ingredients. Her bakery quickly became a favorite among the locals, and she eventually began selling her baked goods online. The princess is now known for her delicious and unique baked goods, and she continues to experiment with new recipes all the time. A cake is her favorite thing to bake because it is so versatile. She can make a cake for any occasion, and she can decorate it however she wants. The prince works in a coffee shop. He is a barista and makes coffee for customers. They bought two horses. 
The horses are named after the two monasteries, the Monastery of St. John of the Argentinian and the Monastery of the Argentinian of the Argentinians. Horses are prey animals and instinctively look to their leader for direction and guidance. And if the leader is acting erratically, the herd will follow his lead. That's why horses are often spooked by their owners' unpredictable movements. When a rider tugs on a rein, the horse will often want to pull away because he's being pulled off balance. And when a rider kicks the horse's sides, the horse may feel threatened and want to bolt. The best way to avoid spooking your horse is to be consistent with your commands and movements. A pair of horses are called a team, a pair, or a brace. The prince and princess built a stable for their horses. They also built a barn for their cows. The prince and princess hired some workers to help them build the stable and the barn. They also hired some farmers to help them take care of the animals. The prince and princess were very happy with their new farm. One day, the prince and princess went for a ride on their horses. They saw a group of farmers working in a field. The prince and princess asked the farmers if they could help them with their farm. The farmers agreed to help the prince and princess. They worked hard to help the prince and princess take care of their animals. The prince and princess were very happy with the help of the farmers. I don't know why this ended up as a fairy tale. Did your parents read to you when you were young? When I couldn't sleep as a kid, I used to read a book, listen to music, or count sheep. Now that I'm an adult, I find that a hot bath or reading before bed helps me sleep. Sometimes I'll listen to calm music if I'm having trouble falling asleep. I don't listen to my own podcast, though. Feels like that would be a bit weird. and maybe a bit narcissistic. I met a very narcissistic bus driver once. She was always talking about herself and how great she was. She would brag about her accomplishments and how she was better than everyone else. She was always trying to one-up everyone and always had to be the center of attention. She was also very judgmental and would criticize others for their perceived shortcomings. It was very off-putting and I avoided her as much as possible. She was a good driver though. We always got there on time. She was always careful and made sure we were all buckled in. She never drove too fast or too slow. I never felt unsafe when I was with her. I guess you could say she was a good driver. When I was young I wanted to be a taxi driver. I thought it would be really cool to be able to drive around all day and meet new people. Plus, I liked the idea of being my own boss and being able to set my own hours. Like I do now with the podcast. I've always been fascinated by cities and how they work, and I thought being a taxi driver would give me a front row seat to all the action. 
Unfortunately, I never got my taxi driver's license. But that's okay, because I'm doing what I love now and I'm happy with that. Plus, I can still pretend to be a taxi driver when I'm driving my car around town. I just pretend that I'm picking up fares and taking people where they need to go. It's a lot of fun and it makes the time fly by. So, if you're ever in my city and you need a ride, just let me know. I'll be happy to pretend to be your taxi driver for the day. Maybe I should do a live podcast from a taxi. I wouldn't drive then, of course. That could be dangerous. It could be fun to do a podcast from a taxi, though. It would be interesting to hear the stories of the people who drive taxis and to get their take on the city. Sometimes I think about all the stories people have to tell that I will never hear. It's a shame. I bet there are some interesting stories in the world of taxi driving. I'm not sure if anyone has done a podcast from a taxi before, but it could be fun to try. Who knows, maybe it would be a hit. If you're interested in trying this, be sure to find a taxi driver who is willing to cooperate and who is comfortable with being recorded. It's also important to make sure that you're not breaking any laws by recording in a taxi. Other than that, have fun and see what stories you can uncover. Once I met a woman who worked at a doggy daycare. She was a little strange. One time, she came to work wearing a dog collar and leash. She explained that she wanted to see what it was like to be a dog for a day. Her co-workers thought she was a little odd, but they went along with it. I bet she would have some big stories to tell. I don't think I would want to work with her. She seems a bit too odd for me. But I would like to talk to her over a cup of tea. And listen to her life story. The other day I went to a farmer's market with a friend. We were looking for some apples because, you know, you should always have apples at home. We walked around for a bit and finally found a stand that had the type of apples we were looking for. We asked the woman working there how much they were per pound and she told us $2.50. We each grabbed a few apples and put them in our bags. As we were walking away, my friend said to me, that's really expensive for apples. I was surprised by her comment because I didn't think $2.50 was that bad. Sure, it's more than you would pay at the grocery store, but I didn't think it was unreasonable. I'm sure there are people who would disagree with me, but I think it's important to remember that farmers markets are businesses too. The people who work there are trying to make a living just like everyone else. So, next time you're at a farmer's market, remember to be respectful of the prices. If you think something is too expensive, move on to the next stand.
There's no need to haggle or try to get a better deal. Just because something is being sold at a farmer's market doesn't mean it's automatically cheaper than what you would find at the grocery store. In some cases, it might even be more expensive. But that's okay. We got the apples and I actually made a cake. It didn't turn out too good. But I think that is more due to my baking skills rather than the apples. My old neighbor used to bake apple cakes all of the time. She would always make an extra one for me, and I would always look forward to going over to her house and getting a slice. The smell of her apple cakes baking in the oven would always make my mouth water. I haven't seen her in years, but I still think about her apple cakes sometimes. She had purple hair and green eyes. And huge glasses. She owned a cat as well. I don't know her name. Yesterday I saw a very big bird in my front yard. The bird was likely a raven or a crow. I think I heard that crows are considered to be omens of bad news. I'm not sure what the raven could symbolize. I'm not sure if I believe in that kind of thing, but it was still interesting to see. Nothing bad has happened so far, so maybe it wasn't an omen after all. In any case, it was a very big bird. I was scared of big birds when I was a child. I'm not scared of them anymore, but I still don't like them. I don't think they're very cute. Cats are way cuter. I had a cat growing up, and I loved to see him run around the house. I also loved to watch him sleep. He would always find the most comfortable spot in the house and just curl up and fall asleep. It was always so peaceful to watch him sleep. He used to dream and mow in his sleep, and it was the cutest thing ever. His name was Simon and he was the best cat ever. I remember my parents thought it was weird that I named him Simon, but I thought it was the perfect name for him. If I got a cat today, I would name him Simon Jr. S.J. I loved science when I was a kid. My favorite book was Abe Lincoln's Science Experiments. I would do all of the experiments in the book. I remember one in particular where I had to put a glass of water in the freezer overnight. The next morning, the water was still liquid. I was so confused. I thought for sure that the water would have frozen solid. But it turns out that water has a very high freezing point. So if you put a glass of water in the freezer, it won't freeze, but if you leave it out, it will. I think that's pretty cool. I also loved learning about the solar system. I had a big poster of the solar system on my wall, and I would spend hours looking at it and learning about the planets. 
I even had a little model of the solar system that I would set up in my room. I was fascinated by space, and I still am today. I learned something new about space last week. A recent study has found that there is a strange bubble surrounding our solar system. Scientists aren't sure what causes this bubble, but they think it might be due to the sun's magnetic field. This is a fascinating discovery and it could help us to better understand the sun and its effects on the space around us. I had no idea that there was a bubble surrounding our solar system. This is just one more example of how much we have yet to learn about the universe. I'm always amazed by how much there is to learn about space. There's always something new to discover. I find it fascinating that we can find out more about space every day, and yet there's still so much that we don't know. Sometimes I think about if there are aliens out there. I don't think there's any concrete evidence that aliens exist, but I think the universe is so big and there's so much we don't know that it's very possible they could exist. It would be really interesting if we found out that there was intelligent life out there somewhere. I don't know if I believe in extraterrestrial life, but I think it's definitely possible. Who knows, maybe one day we'll make contact with aliens. Or maybe they're already here and we just don't know it. That would be pretty crazy. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. In the meantime, I'll keep thinking about it. It's definitely a fascinating topic. I'm sure there are many people who feel the same way. Imagine several hundred years ago when we first started to study space and astronomy. The first thing we wanted to know was the size of the universe. This question has been asked for centuries, and the answer to this question is still unknown. The universe is estimated to be around 93 billion light years in diameter. But this is only an estimate, and it is possible that the universe is much larger than this. We may never know for sure how big the universe is, but it is certainly an interesting question to ponder. Sometimes I try to imagine how big the universe actually is, and it blows my mind. It is amazing to think about how much there is out there that we have yet to discover. The universe is a fascinating place, and I am grateful that we have the technology to study it. Who knows what else we will learn about the universe in the future. It could give you a headache, though. I get headaches just thinking about it. But it is still a very interesting topic to think about. I'm curious to know what other people think about the size of the universe. Do you think it is as big as we think it is? Or do you think it is even larger? Another weird thought, can you believe there were actual dinosaurs that lived on our planet before? I find it amazing that there were creatures on our planet that were so massive and that we have fossil records of them. 
Did you know that a study in 2015 found that there were more than 50,000 species of dinosaurs that lived on Earth during the Mesozoic era? Over 50,000. Some were big and some were small, but all of them were awesome in their own way. I can't imagine what it would be like to see a real live dinosaur. I would probably be scared because they are so big, but it would also be really cool to see one of these creatures that have been extinct for millions of years. My favorite dinosaur has always been the Tyrannosaurus rex because it is so big and powerful looking. And also, who doesn't love a good T-Rex? I remember a few years ago I was on a site, and it was a quiz or something like that, and there was a question about your favorite band, and I put Nirvana, and then it said, do you like them or something like that? Or maybe it was a poll, and I clicked yes, and then it took me to a page for Nirvana, and it had all their songs and stuff on it. I do like Nirvana, but it is not my favorite band. So I don't know why I put that down. Anyway, I guess I just like their music. I don't really have a favorite band, I just like a lot of different music. I used to be really into grunge and alternative music in high school, so maybe that's why I put Nirvana as my favorite band on that quiz. I listen to all kind of music. I like rap, R&B, alternative, rock, pop, country, and pretty much anything else. I don't really have a favorite genre, I just like whatever sounds good to me. I think the only music I don't really like is classical and metal. I'm not a big fan of either of those genres, but I do still appreciate some classical and metal songs. I think my taste in music has changed a lot over the years. When I was younger, I only liked pop music, but then I discovered alternative and grunge music in high school and I loved it. Now, I like a lot of different kinds of music, and my taste changes all the time. I think it's great to be open to different kinds of music, and to try new things. You never know, you might end up liking something that you never thought you would. That's how I feel about music. I'm always open to trying new things and I never know what I'm going to like next. I think that's what makes music so great. There's always something new to discover. If I could play in a type of band, I would like to play in a grunge band who came up with the word grunge. I think I read somewhere that it was a music journalist in the early 90s. He's actually here with us today. Say welcome to the journalist who coined the word grunge. Mark Arm. Thank you, Mark. So, how did you come up with the word grunge? Well, I was just trying to think of a word to describe the kind of music that was coming out of Seattle at the time. I wanted something that sounded kind of dirty and rough, and I came up with grunge, it seemed to fit perfectly. Then what happened? Well, the word kind of took off and everybody started using it. I'm glad it caught on, because it perfectly describes the sound of that era. Do you listen to grunge today? Yes, I do. I think it's great music. 
I'm glad I was able to help give it a name. So Mark, what do you do in your free time? I like to play music and spend time with my family. I also like to go hiking and camping. I'm pretty active. I'm also a big fan of the Seattle Seahawks. Go Seahawks. That's fun to hear. I'm sure your fans are happy to know that you're still involved with music today. So Mark, tell us something unexpected. Well, I'm actually left-handed, but I play guitar right-handed. I don't know why, it just seemed natural to me at the time. I'm sure it's made me a better guitar player in the long run. I also love to knit. That's really unexpected. I would never have guessed that you were left-handed or that you liked to knit. Yes, and I would also like to say that sometimes. I like to listen to classical music when I'm working on my latest project. It helps me to focus. And solve crosswords. That's really interesting. I'm sure your fans will be surprised to hear all of this. Thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. It's been great having you. Now it's time for our next guest, Zona, a toddler who has been on the road touring with her parents, the rock band, Dear Tick, since she was five months old. She has a new book called Sola and the Tulip Ferry. Sola, welcome to the show. Hi. So, Sola, you have been on the road touring with your parents for a long time. You've been to a lot of different places. What's your favorite place you've been so far? I like Chicago. You like Chicago? What do you like about Chicago? I like the food. What's your favorite food in Chicago? I like the deep dish pizza. Oh, that's right. You love deep dish pizza. Yeah. So, Sola, tell us about your new book. It's about a tulip fairy. What happens in the book? The tulip fairy comes and she gives Sola a tulip. That's so sweet. And what does Sola do with the tulip? She gives it to her mom. That's very sweet. Yeah. So, Sola, what do you want to be when you grow up? A rock star. A rock star. Like your parents. Yeah. Well, we will definitely be looking out for your first album. When is it released? I don't know yet. 
All right, well, we will be on the lookout for that. And your parents are here too? Welcome. Thank you. So, how do you guys balance touring and parenting? It's tough, but we make it work. We have a great team of people who help us out and we just try to make it work the best we can. That's great. And how does Sola like being on the road? She loves it. When you're on the road, do you live in a trailer? No, when we're on the road, we live in a van. We don't have a trailer. We used to have a trailer, but we don't anymore. We live in a van because it's easier to travel that way. We don't have to worry about finding a place to park a trailer, and we can go places that a trailer wouldn't be able to go. It's just easier for us to live in a van. We don't really like living in a trailer anyway. We much prefer living in a van. It's just more convenient for us. That is very rock star of you. Did you know that the greatest rock star in the world was called the Strum McStick? Ha played the drums in a band called The Drummers. They were a very popular band in the early decades. Gus was an amazing drummer and was known for his unique style and powerful drumming. He was also known for his outgoing personality and his love of life. He was always the life of the party and was always up for a good time. Gus always said that the best things in life are free. Of course, Gus could say that. He was filthy rich. He was the son of a wealthy oil tycoon and had inherited a huge fortune when his father died. Gus lived a life of luxury and had everything that money could buy. But despite all his money, Gus was a down-to-earth guy who loved music and loved to have fun. He was always generous with his money and was always helping out his friends. Once, he gave a homeless man a thousand dollars just because he was cold. And then there was the time when he bought a new car for his best friend just because he wanted to. You know, when you talk about rock star, you usually mean someone who is famous for their music. But I think Gus was a rock star in the true sense of the word. He was a kind, generous and fun-loving guy who loved life and loved to help others. And that, I think, is what made him the greatest rock star in the world. Indeed. So there you have it. The greatest rock star in the world was called the Strum McStick. A man who was known for his unique style, outgoing personality and love of life. A man who was always generous with his money and always up for a good time. A true rock star in every sense of the word. I always wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a rock star because I loved music and I loved being on stage. 
I love the idea of being able to travel the world and play my music for people. I also love the idea of being able to create my own music and have people enjoy it. Sadly, I never became a rock star. But I still love music and continue to play whenever I can. Who knows, maybe one day I'll still get to fulfill my dream of being a rock star. But for now, I'm just happy to enjoy music for what it is. When my cousin used to play cello, I would listen to her for hours. The sound of the cello always made me feel so calm and at peace. And I would always be in awe of her talent. Every time I hear the cello now, it's a shame she doesn't play anymore. But I'm glad I got to experience her playing while she did. She stopped playing when she left for college, and I haven't seen her since. I heard she majored in archaeology. I bet she's doing amazing things. Maybe she is like Indiana Jones right now. Where she's uncovering some long lost ancient civilization. What if she found the lost city of Atlantis? I bet she's out there right now. Exploring the world and having adventures. Maybe she is having a glad of wine with the president of Atlantis right now, discussing their infrastructure. I wonder how the infrastructure in Atlantis looks like. Do they have roads and buildings? Or is it all just one big city with no boundaries? Do they have cars or horses? Do they even have a need for transportation? I bet the city of Atlantis is beautiful. I bet it's full of sparkling blue water and shining white buildings. It feels like the water is more blue in Atlantis. And the sky is a brighter shade of blue. The air smells fresher and the sun is warmer. The people are friendly and always smiling. I bet it's a great place to live. I wish I could go to Atlantis someday. I bet my cousin would love it there. She would fit in perfectly with the friendly people and the blue water. She would be so happy there. And I bet she would start playing the cello again. I bet even the cello sounds better in Atlantis. Because everything is just so perfect there. Atlantis is probably the most beautiful place in the world. And I bet my cousin is there right now, playing her cello and having the time of her life. If I were to find Atlantis, I would be absolutely amazed. I would want to explore every inch of it and learn everything I could about the lost city. It would be an amazing experience to be one of the first people to lay eyes on Atlantis in centuries. Mysteries are fun. I went to a murder mystery once. During the murder mystery, 
we had to find out who had poisoned the chef's assistant. The assistant didn't die. Lucky for him. But if he had, the murderer would have been the chef. The chef did it. Why would the chef want to kill his own assistant? We don't know. Maybe he was just a really bad chef. Or maybe the assistant was getting on his nerves. We figured it out by noticing that the chef was the only one with access to the assistant's food. And he was the only one who could have poisoned it. We also noticed that the chef was acting really weird after the assistant got sick. He was probably trying to cover his tracks. But in the end, we caught him red-handed. Literally, his hand was red. He had poison on it from where he had poured it into the assistant's food. The thing was, it was not poison. The chef had wanted to play a prank on the assistant and had used red dye instead of poison. The assistant got really mad and quit. The chef was arrested and charged with attempted murder. But the charges were later dropped because it was all a misunderstanding. The chef was just trying to play a prank. But it didn't turn out the way he wanted it to. It was a weird murder mystery. Now that I think about it, the chef should have just used ketchup. Or Tabasco sauce instead of dye. That would have been way funnier. Another time, maybe. I could call the actors and tell them about my idea. We could do a whole new murder mystery with a different chef who uses ketchup or Tabasco sauce instead of dye. That would be hilarious. Anyway, that's the story of the time we had to find out who had poisoned the chef's assistant. It was a weird one. I used to hate Tabasco sauce when I was younger, but now I love it. I guess my tastes have changed over the years. My taste in clothes sure have changed as well. I remember thinking cargo pants were so cool in the early 2000 seconds. What was I thinking? I'm glad my taste in food is better than my taste in fashion. If my taste in fashion was as good as my taste in food, I would be in a lot of trouble. I'm glad I've grown out of that phase. My sister went through a phase where she was really into astrology. She would read her horoscope every day, and she would try to live her life according to what it said. She even started dressing differently, and she would only hang out with people who had the same sign as her. It was a phase she eventually grew out of, but for a while, it was really all she cared about. Her star sign is Aries. Aries are typically independent, adventurous, passionate. 
energetic, courageous. So her horoscope would often tell her to go out and explore or to take risks. And she would try to do those things because she wanted to live up to her sign. West our sign is Gemini, and she would always say that we were total opposites. Geminis are typically communicative, social, adaptable, witty. So my horoscope would often tell me to go out and talk to people or to try new things. My sister always said that I was more like a Gemini than she was an Aries, but she was still really into astrology for that brief period of time. I think she just got caught up in the idea of it all, and she wanted to believe that it could actually tell the future. She also studied numerology for a while. Numerology is a belief in the divine, mystical relationship between numbers and physical objects or living things. So she would often look up people's numerology charts to try and understand them better. She's always been into that sort of thing, and I think it's just a phase she's going through. I'm sure she'll grow out of it eventually. She told me that numerology thought her that. 11 is a master number, and it symbolizes intuition, spiritual insights, and enlightenment. 22 is a master number too, and it symbolizes the ability to manifest your dreams and desires into reality. 33 is a master number as well, and it symbolizes compassion, kindness, and understanding. I don't really believe in any of that stuff, but she does, and I think it's just a phase she's going through. My favorite number is 72, and that means lucky in love and relationships. I think that's pretty accurate. I've always been lucky in love, and I've never really had any problems with relationships. My sister's favorite number is three, and that means creativity, self-expression, and fun. I think that's pretty accurate too. She's always been really creative, and she's always loved to have fun. She's also always been really good at expressing herself. I think she's just going through a phase where she's really into astrology and numerology, and she's trying to understand herself and the world better. That is quite normal, I reckon. I always liked to be in relationships when I was a kid. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people and make them feel better. I'm scared of white coats, so I didn't go to med school. I'm not sure I could have gone to med school. I never been good at math. However, I have a friend that is a math genius. Like an actual genius. He could probably work at NASA if he would like to. But instead, he is a math teacher. He probably wasn't born a genius. 
but he practiced a lot. And he became really good at math. And then he became a genius. We had the same math teacher growing up. So maybe I could have been a genius as well. But I didn't practice as much as he did. So what is the difference between my friend and I? The difference is that my friend practiced a lot more than I did. And because he practiced a lot, he became really good at math. And then he became a genius. I could also be a genius but in something else. What if I studied horses and became a horse genius? I could talk to horses. Well, that would probably make me more than a genius. I would be a horse whisperer. People would write stories about the horse whisperer. Some would say that the horse whisperer has a gift. They can communicate with horses in a way that no one else can. They understand them and can help them to overcome their fears and problems. Others would say that the horse whisperer is just very good at reading horses and understanding their body language. Whatever the case may be, there is no doubt that the horse whisperer is special and that they have a deep connection with horses. These stories would likely be filled with tales of the horse whisperer, helping horses to overcome their fears, to trust humans again, and to find peace and happiness. The horse whisperer is a symbol of hope and healing, and their stories would inspire and give hope to those who read them. Body language is very telling in both horses and humans. Horses use their ears, eyes, and head position to communicate. For example, a horse that is interested in something will have its ears perked up and forward. A horse that is angry or aggressive may pin its ears back. Similarly, humans use their body language to communicate. For example, someone who is interested in what someone else is saying will usually have good eye contact and be leaning forward. Someone who is angry or aggressive may have their arms crossed or may be gesturing aggressively. Body language can be very helpful in understanding what someone else is feeling or thinking. It can also be helpful in predicting what someone else may do. Paying attention to body language can be helpful in both human and horse interactions. It can help you to understand what the other person is feeling and thinking, and can also help you to predict what they may do next. I saw a video about a guy talking about body language the other day. In the video, the guy talked about how important it is to be aware of your own body language, as well as the body language of others. He said that body language can reveal a lot about what someone is thinking or feeling and that it can be used to communicate effectively with others. The guy gave some examples of common body language cues, such as crossed arms or legs, which can indicate that someone is feeling defensive or uncomfortable. He also talked about how making eye contact can convey confidence and interest 
while avoiding eye contact can signal nervousness or lack of confidence. Overall, the video emphasized the importance of being aware of both your own body language and the body language of others in order to communicate effectively. Communication is key for everything. There are different ways to communicate and it is important to know what the best method is for the situation. When communicating, it is important to be clear and concise. It is also important to be aware of your body language and tone as these can also communicate messages. It is important to listen as well as speak when communicating as this will help to ensure that the message is received and understood. I usually think about what I want to say, how I want to say it, and who I am saying it to before communicating. Different situations may call for different methods of communication. For example, if you are communicating with someone who does not speak the same language as you, then you may need to use a translator or sign language. It is also important to be aware of cultural differences, as these can impact the way that messages are communicated and received. Effective communication is key in all aspects of life, whether you are communicating with a friend, family member, co-worker, or stranger. Being an effective communicator can help to build relationships, resolve conflicts, and create a positive environment. Some tips for effective communication are to be clear, concise, and respectful. It is also important to be a good listener. By following these tips, you can become a better communicator and improve your relationships with others. Practice is key. The more you communicate, the better you will become at it. So, go out there and start talking to people. Well, not now. Now we're sleeping. But later. Communication is key. Oh, it started to rain now. I love rain during the summer because it cools everything off. I was just about to go outside for a walk, but I guess I'll have to wait until the rain stops. I hope it doesn't rain all day. I hate being stuck inside when it's nice outside. At least the rain is making everything look fresh and new. I love the smell of rain. It's so refreshing. Maybe I should go swimming in the rain. That would be fun. I don't think anyone would be out in this weather so I would have the pool to myself. That would be great. I think I'm going to go for it. I'll just put on my bathing suit and go for it. Or maybe it's going to be cold. I don't want to get sick. Maybe I should just wait for the rain to stop. Yeah, that's probably a better idea. I'll just wait inside until the rain stops. I can read a book or something while I'm waiting. That sounds like a good plan. 
I'll just wait for the rain to stop and then I'll go outside. I'm going to make something to eat. I'm getting hungry. My father used to make the best sandwich. He would put anything on it. I'm going to make a sandwich like my father used to make. I'll put anything on it. Let's see. I have peanut butter, jelly, cheese, ham, and bacon. I'm going to put all of them on my sandwich. It's going to be a big sandwich. I'll just put everything on the sandwich and see how it tastes. It's raining harder now. I hope it stops soon. Getting bored inside. All right, now it looks like the rain is stopping. It's nice to finally be able to get outside and enjoy the weather. I've been stuck inside all week because of the rain. Not all week. But it feels like it. The rain is good for the flowers as well.